You ready for Sean to come? Yes. Let's welcome Sean Bowles. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. Hey, you guys. Wow. Some people wanted to have some fun on a Sunday night. This is good. And I want the same thing, so this is really good. Well, um, so I'm trying to open my Bible, which is also an iPad, and we kept crashing. Does your Bible ever crash? <laughs> That's anti-biblical. It crashed. Hey, I'm going to show you a video in just a second, but I have this uh, book. This is our 10-year anniversary, Keys, Heaven's Economy book. And uh, this is all about those of you who know that you have a great destiny. There's a resource and provision for every destiny. That means if you're called to do big things, you're going to need favor and finances and connections to do those things. And just like Solomon had the greatest resources known to any generation to build the temple, God is calling you his temple. Paul says we're the temple of God, which means he's going to spare no expense at resourcing his purpose in your life. So this book is really going to help you uh, just grow in faith for the resources of God in your life. And this is, and then I have one more little little video I'm going to show, and then we're going to get right into it. So who is going to be building a multi-million dollar business and hasn't started it yet, but you know it's coming? And this guy right here in the blue striped shirt. You need faith, and if somebody is ambitious enough to say I'm going to build a multi multi-million dollar business, they deserve that book. So all of our, yeah, that's awesome. All of our materials can be gotten, um, all of our books are on PDF or on Kindle, on those types of things, so you can buy them online. And then all of our DVDs, I think, have an MP3 version too, you can get online. So please connect to us at bullsministries.com, but go ahead and show the video. Uh, I think we're doing the Translating God Kit video. The first thing I saw, and I'm just going to step out, and you'll see how this works. Sometimes people are here and sometimes they're not. But I saw um, little kids, these two little girls that were twins. And they're, I think their names were like uh, Aniko and Vashti. Does this make sense to somebody? These are real people? Are you the dad? And these are your daughters? I want to introduce you also to Translating God, the study course. And we did this to break down the book into practical teaching curriculum so that you can take it and actually do something with it. But I felt like the Lord said, He has given you and your wife the gifting as parents to be able to steward their lives so well. He's so proud of you. And you need to hear that. He's so proud of you and your wife for how you're parenting them. They're so loved. The book is a philosophy, a theology, but we know that many of you are going to say, how do I do it though? So we've created a nine session DVD series, we created a workbook, and we also even have a fun little poster that you can put up in your church so that you can say, this is when we're going to do it. The workbook is 11 sessions, you can actually go through it, there's practical activations, questions to ask yourself, questions to ask in the group, so you can see like, how am I growing? How do I grow? What are, what are my goals in this? We have to set goals in anywhere to grow in, and this will help you to set your goals in profit especially when it comes to words of knowledge and words of prophecy, understanding self-management, understanding how to, you know, the spirit of prophet is subject of prophet, like we said earlier. How do you actually manage that? How do you actually do that? If you're a leader, how do you lead a prophetic people? This book is going to be so good for you, and this course is going to be so good at taking it home. So if you're somebody who wants to go deeper, you're leading groups, you're leading the prophetic, or you're somebody who wants to lead this in a small home group format, this is going to be an incredible course, incredible series for you. My team keeps putting these videos together because they know I'm terrible about talking about the materials. I hate doing commercials, but I don't mind watching them. Uh, I'm part of the media generation. It's like, media, yes, I'll do it, but talking, no. Um, so you guys, here we are. Oh, I do have a slide. Go ahead and put the slide up too if you can. This is how to get connected to us. If you want to stay connected to us, you can text 22828 Translating God and you'll get on our mailing list. And the good thing about that is that we send out free media and videos all the time. I'm on TV shows and in events like all the way too much. And so you'll be able to see when we have appearances and what we're doing because I feel like we're growing in something and pioneering something as a ministry. Every ministry is unique and wonderful, but I feel like there's something right now over the last couple of years that's being released that I just want to encourage you go on the journey with us because people are giving us reports by the thousands. I mean, we can't keep up with the reports that they're hearing God and seeing culture transformed because of his voice. 
So we're hearing stories from nations about you know, people who are working with human trafficking, people who are working with presidents, people who are working in business arenas that are like so high level. It's amazing to hear what God's doing. And it's all because he's releasing his voice to do something that's spectacular. So go on the journey with us. That was the, the little thing. Whole commercial's done, yay. So hey. I want to welcome that I have several friends here and I just want to say hi to the friends but there's a lot of you so I'll just say hi and then everybody else you're my new friends and so hi so we got a big old hi to everybody um, but is there any upper room people here Woo -woo. I had so much fun with you guys last month how about clear path church Jordan's church did you guys show up this time Jordan's out of town so well his church didn't show up I'm just kidding but uh I know there's, uh, there's several other churches I've been to here, and I, I love you alls, alls of you. And I'm so glad. Um, say it again. No, no, y'all. I love you alls. And uh, I'm from Los Angeles. It doesn't always work. I actually do say y'all quite a bit. So I want to talk to you guys, and I want to entice you, because I know that I'm dealing with mostly a mature crowd of believers who's walked with God. I'm sure there's a few people here who don't know Jesus, and hopefully you'll get uh, triggered in a good way to, to just hear his voice and know who he is tonight. But I'm going to speak um, to, to a higher common denominator. We're not going to go for the basics tonight, because I want to just give you part of my journey. And I feel like sometimes when you hear stories or when you hear someone else's life, it actually gives you a roadmap for your own, for your own faith. So I just want to give to you out of that place and Hopefully it'll make sense, but I'll give you some um, scripture in this too. And I want to just look at Acts 16 for just a moment because it's really incredible how even Paul made plans, but let the Lord change his plans. And in Acts chapter 16, he's actually on his way somewhere and a vision comes where he sees a man from Macedonia and he realizes, and the man's saying, please come here now. And he realizes he has to go there. And when he, in fact, he goes to Macedonia, he actually doesn't know what to do. He's on a prophetic journey. How many of you have ever been on a prophetic journey? You don't know why you're going, where you're going. You just show up like, here I am, God. So he goes down the river. If you've never done that, it's really fun. And he goes to the river because there's always like these little Christian prayer meetings at the river. It just like happened in that time of history. And so he goes to the river and he finds a group of God-fearing women led by Lydia and she sells incredible fabrics. And these fabrics, she's a multi, multi-millionaire every day because of the types of business she's in. It takes a lot of money to do the business she's in. And he meets her and it's a divine appointment that actually starts a revival in Macedonia. So he doesn't meet a man, he meets a woman who helps him to bring him to kind of like the high society of the area and they start seeing a move of God come all through the area and it totally derails his plans. So we see that he's submitted to, to you know, who God is in the midst of his plans. He's like, here I am God, whatever, I'm going to go this way, but if you speak to me, I'll go wherever you want me to go. And this is a prophetic, one of the many, many prophetic pictures in the Bible of how God wants to lead us and even sometimes divinely ambush us with a new purpose. And what I love about it is that he couldn't have got a clear understanding if he just based it on like this man came because God speaks in parabolic language and God speaks in ways that he invites us to understand his heart, not just a direct meaning as far as, you know, go here and do this, but he wants us to understand his heart culture as well. And I'm going to talk about a couple things tonight. One of the things I'm going to talk about is when God's silent, one of the reasons that we never assume he's silent for. And I'm going to start out there. So I have a couple different subjects we're going to weave in and out. I, I was going through a season and I was thinking about some of you tonight as I was praying to this message. That's why it's going to be a hodgepodge message. But I was going through a season where I wasn't hearing God clearly and I had huge decisions to make. Has anybody ever been in that season? You're like, I am a Christian. I'm your friend. Like, why aren't you talking to me? What is going on? You're like, wait a minute. I'm your favorite. Remember Jesus? Anybody ever feel that way? Like, where are you? And you go to your friends and you're like, can you pray with me? And like, let's try and hear God together. And no one gets anything. Like everyone's, if they get anything, it's like worse. It's like, it makes you more confused. <laughs> Anybody? Anybody? So one of the things that uh, you discover in sonship, if you've had a healthy mom and dad, is that the more mature you get, the better you make them look when you make great decisions. So if you're, you know, 16 and you're dating, you may need their help. But if you're 25 and dating, you better not need much of their help. If you're 35 and you're still single and you're asking mom and dad, please tell me who to marry, there's an issue. 
right? You actually don't bring them glory. You bring them, not anti-glory. I mean, you bring like the, the worst because people are like, oh my gosh, your child's in your basement at 35. They don't know what to do with life. And they look at you like, what happened? In the same way as Christians, God's maturing us. In Hebrews, I love how it says, you know, I want you to leave the elementary things because these are the things of just salvation and, and baptism and all these things. You keep having to drink the milk over and over, but I want to give you mature meat. Now, the mature meat isn't like mystical secrets of Illuminati. Mature meat is John 17 fulfilled. Mature meat is like oneness with God where you really know his mind and his heart in our generation. You really understand what's going on inside of his, his being and like what he's dreaming of, what he's thinking about, what, what is currently available in the supernatural, in, in God's heart for us right now. Mature meat is like, oh my gosh, God wants to use science to prove the Bible. Quantum physics isn't just a theory anymore. It's like starting, you know, neurology is actually proving our spiritual map of how God works. There's things that are happening in psychology right now that are giving us a tool set that's never been here to overcome things that we would never have expected to overcome. And God wants to give us mature meat, but we're still stuck on, I mean, if you watch the average Christian television show or you listen to the average Christian music, the average Christian music is like, oh God, I'm still, I suck and I'm terrible and help me God and in your mercy, please still love me, please somehow. And you're like, I thought we were past that. I don't have to win his love again. Like he already did. Like he won my love on the cross. Like I don't need to win, you know, like I don't understand. And then the average Christian TV show is like, well, we better get back to it. You know, it's like, I don't know how many revivals I've been to where they just run up again and repent. And I'm like, how many times are you going to do that? Like, how many times do you have to rededicate? Like, I don't know. And I was there when I was like a teenager. I, I got saved about seven times. <laughs> And I was like a pretty pure, boring, sinful kid. I didn't have, like I didn't get drunk or like go out and party or do crazy things. But I still felt a need because of religious spirit. Like, I gotta go up and get right with God. I'm like, what am I really doing? You know, I've seen like seven-year-olds going up to get right with God like for the third time in certain revivals. I'm like, there's something wrong with a seven-year-old has to get right with God for the third time. <laughs> And, and the writer of Hebrews was encouraging us, leave the elementary things, not meaning leave them behind. They're already established in your foundation. And now look for what does it look like when you're walking in the fullness of the manifestation of your maturity. Now, I want to put this out there that the Barna Group put out a report several years ago. Some of you read it. And they said the average Christian church in the Western world can only mature you up to five years of Christian maturity up to five years. And so people at that point either stay involved because they have families in the church or they get out of church. And so we have 50% in America of Christians don't go to church. It might even be more, that was just a couple year ago report. It might be even be more now. Or they get involved in leadership. So they're activated in what, you know, something bigger. So it keeps growing them. And so it shows you that something right now in our whole system is a little broken. Going back to the story. If you have to ask your parents at 35 who to get married to, do you have the identity that was supposed to be set when you were 12 and 14 and doesn't bring him any glory? Well, there's times that God purposely doesn't talk to you because here's reality. He loves to watch you choose. He's put his kingdom inside of you and he trusts you. And the more you operate in his kingdom, the better he looks as a father the better he looks as a God. When you make mature decisions that actually thrive in life, that make you thrive, all of a sudden people look at you and go, how are you doing that? And you can tell them what a life in God is like, not just a life as a slave driver, where God, well, God told me to wear this and that's how I got noticed for this interview. <laughs> and that does happen, that kind of stuff every once in a while. Like we, have, we have actors, so sometimes our actors are like, God told me what to wear and I got the part. I mean, I'm, I'm into that, like it, it can happen. But if you wake up every morning going, what should I wear today, God? I mean, the, what about like the freedom of beauty and choice that he wants us to like love that part of our life too? And you can tell people who have a lack of love or a lack of fathering, a lack of affirmation, because there are people who need to be told what to do. And we're full of that in the church right now. And so they get into the supernatural, they get into the spiritual gifts and they use it as a fatherly voice that they're actually, it's not supposed to be that kind of fatherly voice, which is a demanding, commanding voice. And you can tell when you have a, a false Holy Spirit, when it's a voice that demands or commands you to do things that don't bear fruit. 
So I've actually prayed a false Holy Spirit. The enemy loves to disguise himself. A false Holy Spirit off people. I remember this one lady came to me and she goes, when I'm driving, I have so much fear and I hear a voice of the Holy Spirit tell me, go the long way home tonight because if you go the short way, there's a car, you might get in a car accident. And I said, so has, have you ever looked up on like Google Maps or Waze or anything to see if there's a car accident? She goes, oh, I never thought of that. I said, I don't think there's going to be a car accident. I think that's a demanding voice that's not the Holy Spirit that's disguising himself and is actually costing you time and energy. And that's not what the Holy Spirit's like. For me, when the Holy Spirit speaks to me, it's already con- con- he's confirming and affirming who God already is to me. And it's encouraging and it's delightful and it may be hard sometimes and challenging because I have to make different choices, but it's usually in the context of relationships, not in the context of which way to drive home. So I said, I think you need to challenge yourself and not listen to a demanding voice that's trying to get you to do all kinds, like a taskmaster, but listen to a voice that enhances or strengthens or gives you relational decisions that could actually mean something. And a year later, she comes up to me. She's from Bethel, by the way. She comes up to me a year later and goes, oh my gosh, this is 2006, 2007. She comes up to me and goes, I had a demon talking to me in my head all the time because when I said no, I wouldn't listen to that commanding voice and I would only listen to a relationship. She goes, it got more aggressive and more aggressive. This is a mature believer who loves God who's been a Christian for 25 or more years. It got aggressive and more aggressive. And all of a sudden, I'm like, I recognize you, Satan. And she's like, I, I never thought I could as a Christian, but she goes, my parents were really commanding and demanding. They never had the voice of love. And I was, it was all about obedience, not about affection. And so I just, I got in the cycle. And so when I denied that voice, I started to hear love for the first time. And God feels like love and he sounds like love. And ever since then I've said that, God feels like love and he sounds like love. And when you follow him, it makes you look bright, not always good because we get persecuted at times, but it makes you look bright. It, it, it actually causes a light to shine upon your ways. And also, it makes God look good and real. And so there's a lot of people who are going, God, speak to me. And he's saying, I am. I've spoken to you through the word, and I've spoken to you in your foundation, and now you get to choose. And then we feel like, I get the power to choose? I don't know what I want to do then. If God speaks to you in the midst of a season, something huge is because he doesn't want you to miss something typically. But he loves also to guide us by the virtue and the character of our healthy identity making choices because us being formed in God actually has great fruit for good choices that make our father look beautiful in heaven. And this is really hard for the charismatic church. The conservative evangelical church will say it's all about that. We don't need to hear God, we got the word. The, you know, the sensationist, God doesn't speak today, you know, we have the word to guide us. And then, and then the charismatic church will say, ask God about everything, or else you might miss something. Let's come right in the middle now and say, we have the word as our foundation, we have God who speaks to us at times, but if he doesn't, it's because he's proud of us. And he can't wait to see what we'll do. And heaven watches us more than we watch reality television. Heaven's like, Whoa. angels are like watching us like women watch The Bachelor. <laughs> what are they going to choose? Who gets the rose? <laughs> I know, stupid, right? But the reason why, you know, I, I've been talking, and not all of you were here, but about 1 Corinthians 14. One And it says, follow love like your life depends on it. That's the message version. I can't help but read that version because what a powerful sentiment from Paul. Follow love like your life depends on it. He doesn't say any, like follow obedience like your life depends on it because obedience is the fruit of love. He doesn't say follow character like your life depends on it. Some of us have been taught you have to have character, not the anointing. You know what the anointing is? Your intimacy with God when the Holy Spirit rests on you, the anointing is the Holy Spirit, which means he's the friend of heaven. And the more you honor relationship in the anointing, not the power of the anointing, which is when people fall out and do all kinds of stuff, that's a byproduct of the real anointing. But the anointing is your connection to God where the Holy Spirit can rest on your friendship with heaven and he can do things that only can happen when you have intimacy with God. 
And when we honor that anointing, when we honor that relationship, we're always going to have to grow in more anointing and more character. But if we honor character first, then we can get strong enough to do things in our own strength. And the reality is that, you know, people who told me when I was young, you have to build character, brother, before God promotes you. My life has been all promotion with no character. I would get up in front of groups of people and be like, I remember I was in Chicago and I was like, oh my God, I don't know how to even teach. I've never even learned how to teach. Why are they having me teach in front of a whole group? Why do they want me to do this? I don't have any character in teaching. And I'm in front of everybody going, I am te-. And I, a friend of mine sent me the tape. It was like the third time I ever spoke. It was the worst you've ever heard. And God broke out. And some of those people that were in that meeting have started whole movements because of what God did in those meetings. And here's what I said. God is your friend and he loves friendship and he's friend. if you have friendship with God then he'll be friends with you and it'll be proof of friendship. I was like the stupidest, <laughs> cheesiest, dumbest message you've ever heard. And I said, please, I hope this is the only copy because I'm going to burn it forever. And they're like, no, we're saving it for your children. <laughs> But people who are saying, you know, you have to build character first, that's like putting the cart before the horse. So realize character is built as you build friendship because the character is proof of friendship. And each level you get to, all of a sudden, there's a new need for character. You cannot develop the character you need to walk in the full anointing you're going to walk in because the anointing is relationship with God and he's going to take you to places that you're not ready for. I don't get starstruck easy, but one of the first A-list celebrities I met for a week, I didn't, I didn't realize I was doing it to my, I, I was, before I was married, and I was talking to all my, like, people, like, just my four or five guys. I was like, I just met them, and they called me, and they're calling me and asking me what to do, and they're like, they're in my life. and I was like, talking about it, like, it was way too valuable in my heart that I met them, and they were laughing, going, like, you're a little starstruck. I'm like, how dare you? No, I'm not. They're like, you kind of are. And I'm like, no, I'm not. He's just one of my good friends now. You've known him for a week. But I had to graduate what that relationship meant. And I had to graduate how to put my identity straight back in it. And you can't pretend like you can do that before it happens. It was different the first time I spoke in front of 5,000 people versus 500 people, and then I started speaking regularly in front of thousands. That, it was a different character I needed to speak because it wasn't just about the speaking. It was about the types of people who come when there's 1,000 or 5,000. When they come up to you for ministry afterwards, typically the people who will get to you are not people like in the 500 crowds who are just like, that was a good message. Thank you. Can you pray for me for a minute? There are people who are saying, my son is missing. Can you pray and ask God for where he is? So the character that I needed to develop to even know the pull and the draw and the prophetic of what people were going to ask me at 5,000 was way different than 500. And some of you have been told that you, will, you have to grow in this qualifying round before you ever get into the real thing. And I'm telling you, you have to grow in the real thing and you have to protect relationship with God at all costs. And that is the proof of character. Another way to say it is when I was little... I don't know why it happens, but this happens for a lot of guys. When I was 11 years old, I, I was walking down a path and with some friends, and we found a pornographic magazine. I didn't even know there was such a thing. I was like the most innocent kid. I was like sh- in shock looking at the pictures, going, this exists. Like I was just in, co- I was, my world was blown, you know? And I go to my dad, and I, I, I go straight home, and my dad's home early. I'm like, Dad, I saw a pornographic magazine. Or I, I didn't even call that. I was like, I saw a magazine with naked people. My friends and I were looking at it. It was crazy. I, Did you know this exists? And he's like, ah, oh, both kind of laughing and also sad at the same time, really sad. Like, he's like, yeah, son. And, and, and I just had no sexual awakening at all. I was like shocked, you know, just like, how in the world does this happen, you know? And he goes, well, how did you feel when you looked at it? I was like, scared and excited. <laughs> I was like, dad, have you ever seen these? He goes, yeah, unfortunately I have. And he, he said, you know, uh, the, those women that are in that magazine with those men, can you imagine if that was your sister or your mom? And I said, no. And he goes, well, it's someone's sister and it's someone's mom and it's someone's daughter. He goes, how would you feel if someone looked at your mom or your sister like that? I was like, I would kill them. (laughs) I was 11. And he said, well, you need to protect those women because they don't know how to value themselves the way that you're feeling the value over them right now. And he said, the reason why I don't look at these magazines anymore is because when I became a Christian, I began to protect my connection with your mom at all costs because we had years together and every time I looked away from those years at something else, it violated that connection. We were no longer connected. And so I want to I challenge you, son, to find that place of connection and protect it with women. 
I don't remember. It was just done in me. I never had like a pornographic struggle because of that. Because my dad was an example that said, protect connection at all costs. So with Cherie, my wife, when we got married four years ago, I didn't come into it with a, a bunch of baggage, thank God. And there's no condemnation for anybody who doesn't have a walk that's pure in that area. But there's a place inside of you that when you understand that character is protecting connection, but the connection is the anointing that we have to protect at all costs. It helps to dismantle a performance issue that's on your life. And if you come into the prophetic and you come into the supernatural with a performance issue, it will destroy you. That's why we've watched so many people fail in these types of ministries because at some point they're only honored. It's like an NBA player. You're only honored when you're doing well. And you're only honored when you have something to give. I've watched so many people who are healers or prophets or people who have these ministries on a platform and they're on a gerbil wheel of performance because they have to keep coming up with the next thing. And so finally, after 10 or 15 years, you read some of the stuff they come out with and you're like, pinball machine tilt. What in the world did they just say? Do they really want to write a whole book about Nephilim? Really? That's pretty crazy. When there's a whole world that's full of God's love that he wants to do something right now about. And, they're, and they have to have a new revelation because they're not moving in signs and wonders anymore. So they come up with mysterious things about conspiracy. And that's the fruit of people who've lost a measure of connection or in performance. And as a person who's grown up in a church, God wants to give us such a hunger to go after prophecy because it makes his love so beautiful. Such a hunger to go after healing because it makes his love so ridiculously awesome to the world around us. When God brings miracles, the world looks and goes, how? How? How is this happening? How is God this good? What? I mean, and it, and it brings up a fence towards God. I, I remember a friend of mine, um, he heard that a woman with cancer was healed in the church and he didn't believe it. And then she showed him the doctor's report. He didn't believe it. And then he talked to the doctor and then he believed it because the doctor had been an atheist who'd never seen a miracle. And then it happened. And then it brought up a bitterness in his soul. If God is good and he can heal people, why didn't he heal my mom? who had died of cancer. And all of a sudden he had to wrestle with the fact that the reason why he didn't believe in God was because he didn't believe that a God who was good would allow his mom to die. But miracles bring about, and then he got to the point where he wrestled to the point where now he moves in healing ministry. Where the very injustice became something he went after justice for. And, and I, just, I just think about like how people, when there's a miracle, when God shows up in his presence, what a difference. And the world responds differently because all of a sudden they're like, did that just happen? I get a cute, my favorite accusation lately, this is my favorite one, is you are like a bad lower class cruise ship magic show. <laughs> that was one of the false, or the, the reports on the false prophet sites about me, which somehow I read. I was like laughing going, I'm a third rate magic show on a cruise ship. That's really sad, you know. But if you don't believe, then you're offended because I'm just making it up or whatever, researching or doing whatever. And so in, in the healing ministry, is the same way. I mean, Randy Clark's been accused of some things that are just really sad. But if you meet some of the people who've been healed, like one of my favorite people who was healed through Randy Clark's ministry was a Down syndrome person down in Brazil who now leads worship in the House of David. And, he's, and he looks Down syndrome, but he's completely restored. <laughs> worship leader started a movement. And you can't look at him and go, that's not a miracle. <laughs> you can go down and visit him. Lots of people have. I mean, like, he's a real miracle. I've met 20, uh, I mean, I've met a man, Chris Gore from Bethel, who's had over 20 or 30 autistic people completely restored. And that offends the autistic community because a lot of people in the autistic community say, that's just how you're born. But then he's had him restored, and I've met one of them, and uh, who's a young man, and he's just like, just something fired off different, differently neurologically, and I feel reset to the true north that I was supposed to be in in the first place. And people are beautiful before, but if God chooses to restore them to his original plan and design, they're just more functional in the beauty. You know, it's not, it's not like they're less worthy or less worth it or worthwhile, but we've become so politically correct that we're teaching, you know, uh, acceptance for things that was never heaven's intention in the first place. And it's important for us to realize that because God's about to come in the supernatural and do things that you wouldn't believe. I was talking to Todd White, who just moved here just a few weeks ago, and uh, he called me actually on my way to Dallas last time and was like, bro, you would, he's so intense. 
You wouldn't believe it. And I'm like, what? And he goes, I was in a meeting. I was crying after you told me the story. He said, I was in a meeting and I, uh, I called out uh, a girl and, and I started to, I just loved on her and uh, they were trying to cast demons out of her and because she was manifesting like in a really bizarre way. And he said, I just hugged her. I hugged her until something lifted off of her life. And then I just told her, he loves you. I love you. You're worth it. You're worthy. You're awesome. You're amazing. And he hugged her for a long time. And when it lifted off her life, whatever the thing was, and we have no, I love the people who have to have all the, well, it was this kind of demon. This is its name. And this is what's happening. He didn't know. He just was like, it just left. You know, who cares? Jesus came in. Who cares what left? And she, she pulls off her sweatshirt and has cutting all over her arms, some fresh, some old scars, and shows him. And he had just taught the gospel that Jesus restores us back to fullness. And he says, Jesus will restore you back to fullness. He didn't know this was going to happen, but as he says it, in front of everybody, all the scars go away. And then he says, take the mic and preach. And she's like, I don't know what to do. And he goes, tell everybody what God just did for you. And she starts to like passionately preach what she had just come out of and what God just did for her. I mean, it's like literally brand new. This is like getting out of the egg and going, ah, you know, and, and, and then anybody else who's cut, come up here. And like 14 teenagers come up and have the exact same experience of total erasing of the scars. And he was telling me that, and I remember the time I said, Todd, I, I totally, I don't know why I forgot this miraculous time in my life, but I had a two-year window where God was teaching me about spiritual identity and human identity, and I, I just believe he's paid such a high price that we could walk in fullness, so that inside of us, we feel the most real and the most authentic, connected version of ourselves. And I remember, like, we, we went through, like, a two-year period where we went out to the streets a lot. Yeah, I mean, I've always gone out the streets a lot, but this particular time more than ever. And um, I was like, you know, 17 to 19. And I remember we prayed for this guy on the streets. And, we're, and I asked him, like, tell me what your tattoos mean. Because he was tattooed all over, but he, you could tell he had no identity about him. Like, some were from prison, some were from different areas. And he's like, this particular one I hate the most because it was totally like a false season and kind of a, almost like a gang mark, but it wasn't a gang. It was like a group he was involved with, but not a full-blown gang. And he goes, and this one just marked me wrong. Like, I, and there's no way to cover it because of the way it was. And I said, well, let's just ask God to do something about that. He said, well, what would God do? And I'm like, I don't know. But, but, and we prayed for him, and all the bad tattoos went away. All of them. The skulls, the demons. They just saw, and we're like, oh. and I'm telling Todd, I said, we went through a season where about 17 people had tattoos that just disappeared when we prayed for them. That they'd got in wrong seasons of identity. He's like, I'm going for that. And I'm like, do it. Tell me the reports. I'm going to go for it too. I never thought of it since then. But God, and I said it this morning for those of you who are here, he gave us this gift where he manifests his presence to be connected to us. One of the most beautiful things God ever did was sent Jesus to be connected. You can tell when someone's connected because they're focused on you. They're here. They're in the now right now. Have you ever noticed when you've gone out with somebody, they're not in the now? Social media, da -da -da -da, just a minute selfie, just a minute food, just a minute, you know. They're talking to 25 other people and not you. Or someone who's so occupied in their head that they're not like really, you're like telling them something really important and they're like, uh-huh, uh-huh, did you hear what I'm saying? Uh-huh, I'm gonna kill three dogs. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. you're like. <laughs> but what I've learned from going around the world and being with the richest and the poorest of the earth, if you value somebody with time, it's your most valuable commodity because when you're fully present with somebody and you're connecting to them that way, whether the richest person who understands their time is limited or the poorest person who understands it's hardly anyone important will ever give me time. As an American, we have one of the biggest privileges that if we go to the slums, they feel like we're a celebrity. It's like, it's like if Bono came and spent time with you one-on-one -on -one right now, that's how everyone who's poor feels when you go and love on them. Homeless people, it's nice to give them a dollar or food or whatever, but if you'll sit down with them for 45 minutes, they'll tell you their dreams because no one ever spends more than 10 minutes with them. If you treat them like a human being for 45 minutes and you say, I love the groups like Jesus Burgers and the groups that are like going in and they just said, we're just going to have a meal with you for the next two and a half hours. We're going to spend time with you. You can tell us anything. 
I have one homeless guy that we used to reach out to. He's just such a funny guy. Like, I saw him all the time in Hollywood, and he was always crazy and, like, doing the weirdest, like, Tourette's-type tics and stuff. And then my team had been ministering on the streets of Hollywood for every week on Wednesdays for, like, three years. And so they had met him in a different context. I'd only been down with him a few times, and he had never gone there with them, like, uh, to this Denny's that they would take people to. And I show up uh, late after one of our meetings, yeah, and he's with the, and I show up to the team just to see how they're doing, check on them. And uh, they're like, oh, it's been really good tonight. We've had so many, you know, good things happen and miracles and stuff. And all of a sudden, this guy, Frankie, comes up. And I'm like, oh, there's, he's crazy, like straight up as crazy as you get. And he comes up and he's like, hi, guys. And I'm like, what's happening right now? And I'm like, hi. And he's like, oh, who are you? And I said, I'm actually with these guys. He said, okay, then you're okay then. And I'm like, I've seen you around before. And he's like, Oh, yeah. He's like, I used to be an actor, and I kind of act a little crazy because it helps me get more money. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and, then, and then one of the girls goes, Frankie, you know, we've talked to you so many times. Can you just please tell us what you're dreaming of still? Like, what is your dream right now? Past survival mode, what's your dream? And he goes, well, I used to be an up-and-coming musical theater person, like a Broadway singer. And I know I won't do that anymore, but I have um, hundreds of songs I've written and a couple screenplays and treatments. And I have them all recorded on, you know, he has like this smart drive and whatever. And he's like, I have them all, and I believe that something can still happen with them. He's like in his 60s, on the streets for over 15, 18 years. And he's telling us his dream. And I just sat there, and I felt like the, the love of God hit me and say, these guys are, were present enough that a homeless person told them their dreams, which is the most vulnerable place he could be in, who has probably not told his dream to anyone in 10 years. And he tells the dream, and I said, Frankie, will you sing um, a song to me? And he said, I'll sing you my favorite song, which is my favorite song. <laughs> Somewhere Over the Rainbow is my favorite song. And he starts singing, and I start crying. I got ministered to, and he felt it, and he felt my love for what he was singing, how he was singing it, and he actually began to sing it, like with all everything inside of him. And it was like I got my very own like Broadway musical moment through Frankie, the homeless guy who I thought was Crazy Town. (laughs) And I just went, my lack of value for people because my lack of being present and connecting is so astounding. God, help me and heal me and change me. And it's the same when I've been with some, some very wealthy people. I remember I went out with this one group, and it's, you know, like, the prophetic's a weird thing, and this is just being vulnerable. Some people, uh, you just become another. Like, they, uh, any kind of, I don't know. I, I don't know even how to say it. You become like a commodity at some point, like for some people. So there's some wealthy people who are like, I want to meet with the prophet and get a word, you know, that kind of thing, because they've heard of this human reputation. So I'm in uh, an Asian nation with these billionaires, and we're having the best dinner I've had in most of my life. <laughs> with the best grape juice I've had in most of my life. <laughs> and... Uh, And, and we're sitting there talking, and these people, their family has built their nation. Their family's built huge buildings in their nation. This particular couple, who, who are inheritors on both sides of being billionaires, have um, built one of the largest churches in the world, and they're elders at a church. And so as we're sitting there you know, talking, they've drank a lot more juice than I have, and so he's real free-flowing. And he starts to say, well, you know, Jesus is just an idea. He was just, I mean, he was a real person, but like the way we carry him on is just a little ridiculous, don't you think? And I'm like, oh, wow, like something's coming out of your heart. I don't, you're not saved and you're an elder at a church, one of the biggest churches in the world. Okay. And I'm just sitting there and I'm like going, God, this guy's a PhD in business and a PhD in theology. And I'm like, because all Asians have PhDs. No offense, Asian people. (laughs) I speak at PhD schools all over the world, and the majority of people are Asians who are in the PhD programs. So um, so I'm just sitting there going, God, I don't know what to do with this, because they're opening up real vulnerably to me, not just because of wine, but they're like literally like, you know, help us with this. If God's real, you could tell, and his wife's super uncomfortable, but she feels kind of the same way. And they're going through like enough, they've seen enough in life to where they still have hope, to where they don't, but they don't have greater hope. So I look at them and I go, God help me. God help me. No, I'm just kidding. Totally kidding. 
Just so y'all know, I've never been drunk. You don't have to worry. Don't worry about my life. Um, I, I won't come out and scandal tabloids, Christian tabloids, three years from now for being drunk. Don't worry. I'm like the most boring sinner. I've never had anything scandalous yet. You don't have to believe me, but I'm pretty boring. I'm always shocked. Do you ever get shocked when you hear the scandals? I'll go back to my story. Do you ever get so shocked? Because I'm the most trusting person. So like when some, I, I'm friends with people who had like terrible, and I'm prophetic. So you'd think I'd know some of it, but I'm just such a, I'm just such like a, like a, you're the best, you know, that I, I oftentimes have no discernment. And so, because the, to the pure, you just want to believe everything's pure. Like, you know, you, and someone fails and you're like, how does that happen? You know, so I, I'm not saying I'm, I'm not a sinner because we all sin, but I'm just shocked when somebody's like having affairs. I'm just like, I had no idea that happens, you know, but it happens all the time. But it's just shocking. So I, I get shocked. So I was even shocked by these people's confession, but I was also in love with these people. So I said, God, you got to help me. Or else this, because they finally got to this place of connection, vulnerability, and I expect that to be a runway for God. If I can open up my heart to people and build a connected moment, humanly, that becomes the on-ramp for the greater work of the Holy Spirit. Because relationship is the currency of heaven. Another way to say is love is a currency of heaven. So they say this, and it leaves me defenseless, because I have no defense, but I have God. And he jumps on the runway. And I hear about their daughter who's 16, who has purpose confusion that's led to purpose depression, where she can do anything she wants in the world and she has no idea. And she's a late bloomer in her purpose. And she's so upset because all of her friends know what they want to do and how they want to change the world. And she has no desires. And I said, this is your daughter's name. Is this your daughter's name? And they're like, yes. I said, I don't know what you're saying about Jesus and about you know, like him being a historic figure only. But what I do know is that he talks to me and that he's told me about your daughter. Can I tell you what I'm hearing about her? And they're like, yes. And I start telling what I just told you. And I said, but she has a brilliant life of, of social justice efforts with that has to do with some of the architecture stuff that's in your family line as well. And I feel like she's going to change some issues with women at risk. And she's about to get awakened to a calling of justice that's going to change her future. And God's going to heal the purpose depression. And they're weeping. And they're like, God is real. God is real. He, I said, see, he loves what you love more than you love it. He loves your daughter more than you love her. He's concerned, but his concern actually turns into a great effort on her behalf. And you came here to meet with me tonight to figure out if theologically God is real. And all he wanted to talk to you about is your daughter because he knows it's your biggest concern. And that night they got saved. I love when... I love when pretend salvation people get saved. It's my favorite. <laughs> like people who come to church all the time, but they don't really believe. Like we have some of those people in our church, like they'll come to church. They're like, I know I'm supposed to come to church. We've had pastor's kids who are like, I don't really believe in God. I don't know what I believe, but I'm just coming because I'm just trying to be as connected as I can, just in case. <laughs> I love when those kinds of people get saved. It's like my favorite. The reason why 1 Corinthians love is so powerful is because it doesn't hold us to our present or current status, but it holds us to our eternal position. So 1 Corinthians 13, which is the most quoted scripture in history, when we leave the elementary things of just, you know, caring about sin, and we actually care about connection more than sin. It would be awesome if the church, especially creative arts, would care more about connection with God than about defeating sin. Sin was defeated at the cross, and connection restores us to the right place. So it's, it's amazing. So if we would care, like love is patient, love is kind, love does not boast, love is not envious. We've all heard this a million times. It's quoted at every, even unsaved weddings. I was at a Hindu wedding, they quoted it. It was crazy. I'm like, that's that's kind of like the Bible. No, that is the Bible. They're actually quoting the Bible. And this is a, it was in, you know, Thailand. And I was like, they're quoting the Bible in Thailand at a Hindu wedding. Okay, cool. It's quoted in movies. It's quoted all over the place. And so people understand that love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not self-seeking. All these things. And I remember God one day I was praying and I, God told me to read the Bible and every time it said love in the New Testament to put his name there. And so I start reading, and I'd never done that before. And so I was reading 1 Corinthians 13. I'd gone to that chapter, and, and he said, really pay attention. And I was like, God is patient. God is kind. God is not easily angered. 
God holds no record of the wrong. And I was like, I've never seen you in this context of love. I mean, I have in different ways, but this is really cool to see in the scripture that way. But this is where it got hard. He said, I want you to put your name in there now. John is patient. Oh, no. (laughs) I hate that that's the first one because that's... I am not patient. I live in LA traffic. I'm like, I was, I was demonized in traffic until I read that. I was like, I hate traffic, you know. That person just cut me off, you know. Now I have so much peace. Like, it just helped me to build some character. It was so much, because I'm like, this can be a gift of time. I can actually talk to people on the phone finally, because I, I never talk on the phone unless I'm in traffic. It's perfect. So it's great I live in LA, because I actually use my phone now to call people. I never, had no idea that there's a redemptive purpose for traffic for some of us, you know? <laughs> but Sean holds no records of the wrong. I'm like, I better not ask Sheree, you know, my wife. How do you feel I do in that part of love? <laughs> Sean is not easily, easily angered. Sean does not boast. And I'm like, wow, there's a measuring stick for love. And I'm doing good on some of the measure. <laughs> Thank God. And then others in the measure, I'm like going, oh, if that's what love looks like, and that's what I'm supposed to bring, you know, we had a whole company of transgender people start to come to our church, and most of them were homeless youth, and it blew our church up, because they didn't, we didn't know which bathroom they should use and what should happen. It was before the whole bathroom thing started happening here in America, and so they were going to the women's bathroom, and none of our young women cared. They're like, this is so cool, they're in church, they're trying to come and find God, but after about a year, the older generation people were like, you need to fix this. You have to put requirements on them, because they can't come to church for a year and not start having new standards. I'm like, I don't know how to, I can't manage their standards. You have to pastor them. I'm like, pastoring doesn't require them to change unless they ask us to pastor them. If they ask us to like become like official members in the sense of membership, or if they ask us to come and they want an influential position in our church or whatever, they want to be door greeters or they want to be on the worship team, I will require something out of them. But if they're just coming because they feel the love of God, even if it's after a year, I don't know what to do with that. And they're like, you have to, you're letting them live, live delusion. You're letting, and I'm like, I love you. And I love these people who are telling me this, but I was like, I, and my whole, my whole executive team, the Toledo's who took over the church for me, we were all in the same position. We were like, we can't require people who just want to come in the church and sit there to change. We want them to, but we can't require them to change. And I remember how hard it was for everybody because they wanted to pastor an issue more than touch the heart. And I remember for me, there was a guy on our... Um, who was on our worship team who was doing voice training. He wasn't actually on the teams on stage, but he was doing voice training. And he'd come out of a, uh, a, I don't remember if it was a 12 year or eight year time of uh, extreme homosexuality where he was in West Hollywood and he was doing all kinds of stuff. And it was like not, not an integrous way of presenting any kind of sexuality, period. And so when he came to us, he went into a healing journey and he had a deliverance right away, but he also had to go through a process because the deliverance wasn't a full everything deliverance because he had abuse from his growing up and stuff. And I remember going to his counselor because we told him, as long as you're in a process, we trust you. We, we'd love for you to be a part of our worship community, and we'll figure out how that works as we go. Well, he ended up becoming the voice trainer for our worship team for a while, and he also was working the Michael Jackson tour and doing some stuff. And I, I remember asking his counselor, this is so illegal, how long do you think it'll be before he changes? Before this is never a struggle again? And he goes, excuse me? Or, you know, like, how? come on, tell me the process. And he goes, you should be more concerned with loving him than figuring out when he's going to change. Because it took him this many years and a life of abuse to get here. He is doing awesome. Celebrate how awesome he is. And I'm like, oh my God, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Running away like, ah. Because he's in a process that he's committed to that he's trying to change and love well. And it's not an abusive process. It's a great process. And I'm challenging it because I can't see the fruit of complete change yet. Because we measure change by the end result, not the, not the process. And back to being present, God is in our present, which means that if we're in process in something in our life, he's so proud of us for being in a process. I feel like the majority of Christians, if you're not in an immorality that you can go to jail for, you probably need to be in some sort of leadership because it'll help you grow faster. You know, it's like, if you can't go to jail for what you're doing, then you probably need to be in a home group and leading it or something. <laughs> because you'll change faster when you have to 
caretake people. I've, it's like the, the, the gorilla that, you know, everybody decide they're going to become the zookeeper, that they can run the zoo better than Cincinnati zookeepers because the, the gorilla is dead. How dare we? And all, my internet blew up. Did your internet blow up with that one? My internet blew up. All I heard about was the gorilla. I'm like, and I heard all kinds, because of, I'm involved with a lot of uh, social justice, civil rights stuff. So I had the extreme camp of like, how dare they kill the gorilla? I'm like, my daughter is three, and she can get away from me at times. <clears throat> Never in a dangerous way, but I can imagine her if she had one of her moments and one of her days, because she thinks she's the most powerful person in the world. She thinks she's, she's told me before, I'm your boss. And I'm like, no, you are not. <laughs> Daddy, I'm your boss. And then she tells me, I'm going to lead right now. She tells me that all the time. I'm going to lead. We'll be in a store. She's like, I'm going to lead. <laughs> Three years old. I'm like, no, I'm going to lead. You stay right here next to me. No, I'm going to be in front of you. I'm going to lead you, Daddy. I'm like, you don't know where we're going. She goes, it's okay, Dad. Like, I got this. She just turned three. We're not talking about a mature three-year-old. We're talking about just can barely talk three. Like, just learned how to talk three months ago, five months ago, three, you know? So these people who lost their, their little toddler, I'm like, first of all, I'm a judgment-free zone. I have a three-year-old. So I'm not saying that they didn't do anything wrong, but I'm just saying, like, we need to, if you've had a three-year-old, you understand, a powerful three-year-old, you understand. But second of all, like, is anything worth the life of a child? No. So, but everybody became a zookeeper and a zoo expert overnight on the internet. It's like people who are like, I, if I put out there at all on my Instagram or whatever, oh, my daughter has a runny nose and she kind of has a cold. I will get a hundred, like to a thousand emails from people behind the scenes that say, have you tried this essential oil yet? Have you rubbed this on her feet? Have you diffused? Have you tried this organic garlic crushed from there? We'll buy it for you. You know, like, I'm like, oh my Lord. Like I just, one time, I put on my Facebook right when Harper was first born, I wanted to pick a fight and just see what happened. So I just put the question, inoculations question mark. That's it. I had 570 responses in eight minutes. And it was a war. And I went, wow. Again, getting popcorn and drinking Coke, just like a movie. And it speaks to the fact that Christians really value having a voice and an opinion. But we have to not let our voice and our opinion violate love first. And where we don't have relationship, we don't have the right to speak. We have the right to have an opinion, but we don't have the right to speak. So where we don't have a connection or relationship, we can't solve issues. Protesting was a beautiful thing in a generation. It still works in some ways, but it's not the primary way that change or social change happens anymore. It's just not the primary way. There's a whole new ways that it happens. So if we pretend like holding up signs outside of a place is going to be the primary way that something will change like it did in the 60s, because a lot of people saw things change because of protests and sit-ins and all that kind of stuff, it's not working the same way. It has not worked since the, then very many times. And there's something about Christians who we've, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting different results. And there's many things that we've done. And one of the things we have to learn from is that God wants to l teach you how to be socially aware and self-aware so that you can connect relationally and then you'll be anointed. And if you try and speak without those two part of the equations, then a lot of times you come off as socially awkward because you're trying to speak into something that you haven't paid a price of relationship for or connection to. The prophetic works best in relationship. No one's ever said that before. I, I've, I asked all other prophetic people, have you ever said prophetic works really good in relationship? Most of the prophets told me, no, I told people for years it works better with people you're not in relationship to because you don't know about them. Where your love is turned on the most, the prophetic works best. I mean, there's always things you don't know. I was with Pastor Chang on, who's one of my like, spiritual you know, fathers, and he was, he was on the front row in Singapore of a conference we were doing, and I called out this guy over here. I go, I just see Heidi Baker saying, ho, ho, ho over you. What does that mean? And he goes, my name's Ho. I was like, are you from the Philippines? He was like, yes. And I look at Pastor Che, who I've known since I was 19 years old, and I said, Che, does that mean something to you too? Ho, I keep hearing Ho over you. And he goes, 
no, nothing at all. And I'm like, oh, okay. And his daughter, Mary, who's one of my good friends, is sitting next to him and goes, Dad, that's your middle name. <laughs> and he, he doesn't necessarily like some of his heritage, so he didn't like his middle name. And so he has been in denial of it for a long time. And then I got, like, street addresses they lived in in five places right there on the spot, five places, and said the revivals that broke out at those five places are culminating, and you're going to see a move of God in this next season that has elements of all five of those. So look back with Sue over the five seasons because you're about to move into something that will be the culmination and empowerment of all five seasons. And he's like, I mean, he was shaken. He was freaking out for like months over that word. And he said, it reminded me of the first time that Paul Cain called me and Sue out by our names and he didn't know anything about us. And all he said was our names and that God would be with us. That's all he said. And he said, we lived off of that for two years because God knew our names. But here years later, I'm prophesying over someone I've known for most of my life. I'd have complete authority to do it because my love has turned on. I love Che. I can't wait for him to succeed. So therefore, it's easier to talk to him than a stranger in the crowd. And some of us have been told that our love and the people we love, we can't hear from them because it'll be tainted or it'll be like, you know, we know too much or whatever. No, no, no. The people you love the most, that's the landing strip for God's presence to come on that relationship and change everything. If we give each other if we give each other the moment of time that we're in right now and we're fully present and we allow each other to be relationally connected and we're socially aware and emotionally aware and self-aware, there's no telling what God will do in this next revival. We have to build us. We have to, you have to build yourself. You have to build yourself to the point where you go, I love myself. God is awesome in me. I'm, I'm awesome in him. And when you do that, man, talk about the world is not worthy of those kinds of sons and daughters because when you do that and you're an eternal being where what you do here isn't as important as who you love here because you're going to be doing stuff for eternity that's awesome I mean I'm hoping I get to fly and build things that are better than Star Trek you know but here what I get to do that's awesome is to love well you know here's what I get to do is connect and I become a life experience junkie for people now so like I've gone all around the world and his love has never failed. I've shown up in places, like we showed up in this one slums. They'd never seen us before. We said, can you gather any school children? They were all out. They all, they all gathered and we said, God wants to heal all of you. And I'm like, I never hardly moved in heal, or at the time moved in healing, but I was just believing for more. God wants to heal all of you. They're all under 12 and they all are hungry and they all have open sores and they're all sick and they're all runny noses. And I'm like, God wants to heal all of you. And then they came and did performances for us first and then we just prayed for them and every single one was healed starting with a Muslim teacher who taught the school. And I went, I went, this is, this is the Africa story that you hear. Like, this is the Africa story. And I came home and I said, God, if you could do an Africa for people, my heart's not even connected to you. What about my family? And the missing part of the equation for many of us is we don't believe for God's fullness in us or those around us. If you start there, your prophetic gifting will be so big outside of that if you start there. Your supernatural belief for God to move and intervene will be so big for nations if it feels like he's big in your house. If it feels like he's big in your world, then everything will be big. Isn't God good? So I want to pray for you, and I'm going to do it more of a corporate prayer, and then I'm going to do some individual prophecy because I wrote down some things, praying for you in advance, believing that God was pointing at tonight that he wanted to speak to some of you. But I also want to tell you that some of you have this prophetic gifting that's been dormant or that it hasn't been on the forefront of your life right now, that some of you are going to get reinitiated right now for a higher level of the prophetic that you've been hungry for in different seasons, but maybe it's not your most current hunger, but it's, it's in there. And I feel like God's saying he's pulling to the surface a bunch of people's prophetic desire to see radical, radical things happen. And for me, anytime God speaks real things, because I'm still shocked every time. Like, I'm like, oh my gosh, you, your name really is Billy? Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, this is for real. Like, I still get caught up in the wonder of God. Like, I'm in awe that God knows people and that I'm doing it, because I'm a skeptic. So like, when it happens to me, I'm like, going, yes, thank God this worked, you know? I say that all the time. It worked? Oh, thank God. And people think I'm joking. I'm like, that's a real moment for me. Like, I'm going, oh, because I'm still three years into this, the word of knowledge thing, I'm still in shock. So 
I hope I never get out of shock, but it's just been awesome. So I'm going to pray for you for that desire to increase. I'm going to prophesy to some of you. And the words that I give are confirmation of the greater word I'm saying, which is be the most powerful version of you. Fall in love with yourself. Fall in love with God inside of yourself. And fall in love with the world around you. And you'll, be, you'll have no limitations on the supernatural if you'll just do that. You know, so Holy Spirit, I pray that you would come. Lord, I pray that I... Uh, uh, you would just detoxify us from anything, any, any theology that's just been bad theology when it comes to the supernatural. And that you would put inside of us such a hunger to be loved to the world. That you put in, in, in a, a roadmap inside of us, God. And Lord, thank you that those seasons that you're not talking to us about our life direction, it's because you love us and you love to watch us choose and we bring you so much glory. And I pray that people who've been divinely frustrated here would get over the frustration tonight as they can make decisions based on what's true inside of them. Lord, for others here, Lord, I pray that you would initiate a process where we do hear your voice and where we're on a prophetic journey like Paul, where you, Lord, you have the right to ambush us and interrupt us. And we just pray that you would bless us and all of these things, Lord, work, work into us a greater maturity. Let us focus on the mature things, not just the elementary things. In Jesus' name, amen.